Welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. If this is your first time watching our video series, let me tell you a little about it. Now, if you're like me, you enjoy watching board game reviews. But if you're especially like me, after you've watched a few of them, you might have identified a couple of games that, ah, they probably wouldn't suit you. However, you're then left with the 10, 20, or 30 reviews that you watch that, man, they made you really want to buy that game. How do you decide on just one or two games that you can actually afford? Well, we're here to help complement those already great board game reviews by taking you a few steps further into particular games. Usually what we'll do is we'll start with a video, like this one, where we're going to cover the basics, the instructions for how to play the game. Then we're going to follow it up with a video that shows you how to set up the game to play it. And then the rest of the series, we're actually going to play the game. So it's going to help reinforce the rules to the game for you, also show you how those rules work to make the gaming experience, and hopefully it's going to give you a sense of what it would feel like to play the game. Now we don't want you to just watch. When it's possible, we want you to be able to interact with us and help influence the gameplay. Sometimes that means we can actually have a player at the table that's dedicated just to our online viewers and you'll be able to vote on what moves we do next. Other times, we might just have to leave you to maybe vote on the direction, the general direction we'll take as we move forward in the series. But we don't want you to just watch. Where possible, we're going to invite you to join in and play along with us. That might mean there's going to be a player in the game that you're going to be able to take control of and through voting online, decide what that player's moves will be. Other times, if the game doesn't really suit that style, you might be able to vote on just sort of a general direction that we'll take as we play. When you finish watching one of our playthroughs, we're confident that you'll be confident about whether or not the game is a good fit for you. We really thrive on your support. So leave us your comments, ask questions, we'll definitely try to answer them if we can. If you like what you see, maybe subscribe to our channel. But in particular, if you find that we're helping you spend your gamer dollars more wisely, consider sending us a donation to watchitplayed at live.com through PayPal. We'll make you an executive producer for our series, we'll give you credit in one of our episodes. And also, for the month of November, I'm growing this hideous mustache. So for all the money that we collect during November, half of it we're going to put towards the Movember Fund. If you're not familiar with what Movember is, I'll put a link to it in the description. Anyway, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoy the series. Let's get started. In this series, we're going to be playing Dungeon Run. It's a game published by Plaid Hat Games and designed by Mr. Bistro. One of the things I really like about the cover art is you can tell what the game is going to be like just by looking at the box. On the front here you have a knight and a dwarf consulting with each other on how to fend off these attackers. The elvish archers jumped into action ready to launch an arrow into this monster's face. And behind her another hero comes to protect her in case things go wrong. So like a lot of the games we played in these series, it's another cooperative game. Actually, now that I'm looking at this, kind of looks like maybe the dwarf and the knight are about to trade blows and the elvish archer i it, can't tell if she's aiming at the monster at the back of this knight's head and now that i'm looking at it this this figure in the back it looks like he's gonna stab her in the back so is this a cooperative game or what <laughs> well it's a little bit of both in the game you may form temporary alliances with the other heroes however once someone has collected the summoning stone, the final treasure in this dungeon, all bets are off. And all the players will be actively trying to kill that player and collect the treasure for themselves and then escape the dungeon. So the game has an optional cooperative element. It definitely has a stab your friend in the back element too. So to see how the game plays, let's look at some of the components and I'll explain how they're used in the game. You'll be playing as one of the eight provided heroes in the game box. You'll get both a hero card that has the hero's abilities and stats, as well as a model that you'll use to represent the hero as you move around the dungeon. Let's take a closer look at Bearden, and I'll explain to you the different stats and abilities on the card. The heroes, of course, have heroic names, as well as a race and training. The race and training affects both how they interact with other players, what kinds of equipment they can carry, and sometimes how monsters respond to them as well. The heroes also have a brawn and a magic rating. Now those are mainly used during combat, but they can sometimes come up at other times as well. They have a skill rating, which is usually used when they're faced with a trap that they have to get out of, or if they're trying to evade a monster or another hero. You also have a life rating, and if that is ever reduced to zero in the game, you can either be knocked out or potentially killed and kicked out of the game permanently. Over on the left side here, we have a list of abilities. 
The first two here that are kind of in brown, those are the abilities you have all the time. Those are your base abilities, and they'll give you benefits during the game. This ability here that's in red is the ability that becomes active once you collect the main treasure of the game known as the Summoning Stone. That's truly the objective of the game. You're trying to get the Summoning Stone and then get out alive. So this ability is especially important because you're going to need all the help you can get once you have that stone and everyone has turned against you. Also, your hero is going to get this stack of ability cards. At the beginning of the game, you'll receive, randomly, one of these ability cards to use. And then throughout the game, you'll be able to level up your character and collect additional ability cards. Because this deck is shuffled, you'll never be quite sure what abilities you're going to get and in what order. But we'll talk more about that during the game setup in the next video. As you explore the dungeon and defeat monsters, you'll be able to collect treasure. Here's an example of two different treasure cards, the Axe of the Father and the Poison Dagger. Below their names, they have something called Slots Used. Your hero has a primary hand slot, an offhand slot, a body, and a head slot. Once you've equipped an item into one of those slots, you cannot equip another item into that same slot without swapping out the item that was currently there already. The cards also indicate what kind of training your hero must have in order to equip and use these items. For example, the Axe of the Father requires either the War or the Prayer training, whereas the Poison Dagger requires either War, Magic, or the Talent training. In this case, Viridin has the Prayer training, so he can only use the Axe of the Father and not the Poison Dagger. So sometimes cards will be played face up beside your hero card to show that they're in use, and other cards, like let's say Bearden had collected this Poison Dagger, which he can't equip because he doesn't have the right training, those cards would go face down in a loot pile that he keeps, but isn't considered to be in play. And of course these items have abilities, special benefits and bonuses that are listed in these paragraphs here, and are used at the appropriate time during the game. There are also artifact cards in the game, and these are very similar to treasure cards. However, treasure cards are revealed at random times during the game, and these artifact cards come out at specific times, maybe based on a tile that was played or a monster that was defeated. And no item is more important than the summoning stone. When you defeat the boss of the dungeon, he'll drop this stone and you'll be able to collect it. And once you have it, it will activate your summoning ability, along with other special abilities. And then you must get out of the dungeon, which will be difficult because every other player will be now trying to kill you so that they can collect the summoning stone and get out of the dungeon and win the game. And then there's the encounter deck. Now the encounter deck is made up primarily of monsters and traps, some of which are shown here. And there are a couple of cards known as strangers in the deck, and those are cards which are helpful. But mostly when you draw an encounter card, you're expecting the worst. We'll talk about the information on these cards in more detail when we discuss combat and what happens when you encounter a trap. Eventually, after exploring the dungeon, you will find the boss's lair, and then one of these four randomly selected bosses will reveal themselves and you'll have to defeat them in order to collect the summoning stone that they carry. These are more powerful than the typical monsters that you encounter, but the stats on them are very similar. We'll talk about their abilities in more detail when they come up during gameplay. There are also some player aid cards that just help remind you of what actions you can take during your turn. Aside from all the cards that you find in the game, there are also different kinds of tokens, like these wound tokens here. They come in both a value of 1 and, if you flip them over, a value of 3. So when you're injured during the game, you'll be placing these wound tokens on your character. And if the number of wound tokens ever match your life, as we indicated earlier, that means your character can be knocked out or potentially killed. Monsters can also receive these wound tokens, and they have a life value which can also be reduced to 0 and allow you to kill that monster. Thankfully, not all the tokens are bad. You can also collect these training tokens. These allow you to add bonuses to your brawn, magic, or skill. And you'll be able to collect these during the game as you level up your character, also known in the game as advancing your hero. The last kind of token is the first player token. The first player token is passed out at random to one of the players at the beginning of the game. This player will be taking the first turn. Then all the other players will take their turns and once the turn comes around again to the first player, instead of taking their turn, the first player will pass the token to the player on his or her left, and that player will take their turn next, becoming the first player. The token will be passed around in this fashion throughout the game. You'll see better how that works during the actual gameplay videos. The game also comes with lots of dice, and we'll see how those are used in just a bit. The game also comes with dungeon tiles, like this. These are considered the standard dungeon tiles. They have kind of a gray color to them. 
There are also special tiles like these. They have kind of a green tint to them. They're each unique and they have special abilities listed on the card. Lastly, there's the boss lair and the entrance tile. The entrance is the first tile to be played, and all of the players place their hero models on the entrance tile at the beginning of the game. The boss lair is revealed at the end of the game after all the other tiles have been explored, and that is where the boss card will then be revealed, and you'll see who it is you'll be fighting to retrieve the summoning stone. Once you have that summoning stone, it's your job to race back to the entrance, and if you can make it to the entrance alive carrying the summoning stone, you will win the game. Some of the specific rules of the game will be best to explain during the actual gameplay where they'll make more sense. But what you need to know is that during a player's turn, they can take up to two of a variety of different actions. And I would like to explain the rules to some of those actions now. To illustrate these actions, I'm just going to use this entrance tile and our Biradin hero as our example. The first action I want to explain to you is the move action. Now at the beginning of the game, you'll be taking a certain number of the dungeon tiles, shuffling them up, and placing them face down somewhere in the gaming area. Then when you want to move, you have to have an exit to move from, and in this case, the entrance has one exit right here. So we would then draw a tile and place it so that one of its exits match up with the tile we're attaching it to, like so. Then we can move the hero into that tile space. Now if you look closely at the tile we just moved to, there's information about treasures and encounters. If you move to a tile that has this kind of information on it, then you have to roll a single die. And depending on the result, you'll be either placing a treasure or an encounter card or possibly both. For instance, if you roll a 1, you would only place a treasure card there. And if you roll a 6, you'd only be placing an encounter there. But if you roll a 3, you'd be placing both a treasure and an encounter card. If you're placing a treasure card, it always goes face down on the tile. And encounter cards always go face up. And if you've drawn both a treasure and an encounter card, the treasure card goes face down underneath of the encounter card to show that you cannot collect the treasure until you've defeated either the monster or resolved the trap. Because we're focusing on movement, I won't bother to draw either a treasure or encounter card at this point. So now if we want to move again, we have three options. We can go to the left, to the right, or straight up. If we want to go to the right, we would go this way. We would draw a new tile, and this one we would add like so. Then we could go to the new tile. We would roll a six-sided die and see if treasures or encounter cards come out. Now keep in mind, if this was a single turn, I would have used up both my actions moving like that. But for the sake of this illustration, let's just assume I have unlimited actions. So let's say I want to move again, but this time to the south. I draw a new tile, but here's a problem. This tile has exits on all four sides, which means that this exit would run into a dead end right here. You can never place a tile where it wouldn't fit up with all the other tiles adjacent to it. In this case, we would just discard this tile for now and then draw a new tile. Well, this one also wouldn't fit. We'd have to discard it and then draw another tile. This one would fit because it doesn't have an exit coming out this way, so we could rotate the tile and then it would be able to fit, like so, and our hero could move to that tile. Once a hero has ended its action, these tiles that were discarded would be shuffled back into the dungeon pile and the game would resume. If it turned out no tile could be found that would fit in this location, then the player would have to stay on this tile here and would lose that action for the turn. As we mentioned, some tiles are considered special tiles, like this one here. And we'll talk about the specific abilities of those tiles when they come up during the actual gameplay. So let's go back again, and let's pretend that Bearden had just left the entrance tile and landed on this new tile. We rolled a die and got a 3, which meant both a treasure card and an encounter card are going to be revealed. So we'll place the treasure card face down on the tile, along with the encounter card face up, and we've revealed a wolf monster. When a monster is first revealed on a tile in this way, an immediate battle takes place, and this battle does not use up one of the hero's actions. But this is a great way to show you how the battle action is used during the game, because during the game you can choose to battle monsters or heroes. So let's take a look at how battles take place by zooming in on the hero card and the encounter wolf card. So in a battle with a monster, the first thing you need to do is look at the monster's attack rating, which is listed here. The wolf has an attack of 5, and that means you're going to be rolling 5 dice for the wolf. Now, for the purposes of this illustration, I'm not going to roll the dice. I'm going to assume that we get certain results. Once we've rolled the attack, we have to see if any of these attacks are potential hits. And to do that, you look at the power rating of the wolf. 
and we see a three and a four. Now what that means is only threes and fours that we roll are potential hits against us. So even though we rolled six and fives, which are high numbers, that's irrelevant. It's only numbers that match the power rating that could be potential hits. So all of these dice are removed from the attack at this point. But now it's our turn to roll our attack dice. Now when you want to attack, you can choose to attack with either your brawn or your magic. And the value of your brawn or magic is the number of dice that you'll be rolling. Now looking at these numbers right now, it seems like brawn would be the sensible thing to attack with because that's the higher number. However, if you look at the Call Lightning ability on Viridin, it says you may roll three extra dice when attacking with your magic rating, but must place one wound marker on your card. So I actually would be able to roll six dice if I attack with magic, but I have to take a wound marker. But let's do it. So I'm going to place a wound marker on Viridin, and then I'm going to roll six dice. So let's assume again that this was the result of me rolling my six attack dice. To see if any of my dice are potential hits, I compare my results to the defense of the wolf, and it shows here 4 plus. That means any roll of 4 or more is a potential hit against the wolf. So if we did nothing else at this point, the wolf would be making 2 hits against me, and I would be making 1, 2, 3, 4 hits against the wolf. However, I have an option to block some of the attacks from the wolf. If I have rolled any dice that match the value of any of the dice rolled by the wolf, I can assign those dice, instead of being attack dice, I can assign them as blocking dice. So with these two attack dice, I've now used them as blocks against the wolf's attack. This means the wolf will do no damage to me this turn, and instead I'll be doing one, two, three points of damage to the wolf. Now three damage against the wolf is not enough to kill it. But keep in mind, blocking is optional. I don't have to use my attack dice to block, and let's say I didn't want to use this dice to block, instead I wanted to keep it as an attack die. This would mean one of the wolf's attacks would be coming through to me, and I would be taking one wound. But I would now have four attack dice to apply against the wolf in damage. So in this case, I do four damage to the wolf, and the wolf does one damage to me. Four damage is enough to kill the wolf, so I would then get to collect this wolf and add it to my own loot pile. We'll talk about what I can do with that encounter card later in this video. You'll notice my other ability is called Foe of Undeath. It says I can remove one wound marker from your hero card each time you defeat an undead monster or undead hero. However, this wolf was a monster beast. If it was undead, it would say so right here under the wolf's name. So that's how combat works against a monster. Now if you're on a tile that has a face down treasure card and no monsters, you're free to search the tile for treasure. That's another kind of action. When you use your search action, you're able to flip over any treasure cards that are on the tile and examine them. You read aloud any treasure cards that you discover so that everyone knows what they are, and then you get to take them all. Now in this case, we found a poison dagger, which we discussed earlier can only be used by war, magic, or talent heroes. Our hero is a prayer hero, so he will not be able to immediately equip this weapon. If this was an item that he could equip, he can equip it right away as soon as he gathers it up. Instead, this will go in the loot pile along with the encounter card that he collected earlier. Now, although we've talked about what happens when you fight a monster, we haven't discussed what happens when another hero arrives on your tile and decides to attack you. Let's assume for this example that Emma has arrived and wants to take a swing at Viridin. There are just a few differences between the rules for fighting monsters versus fighting heroes. In this case, Viridin would roll first. Once again, he chooses either his brawn or his magic rating. Let's assume this time he wants to use his brawn, so he would roll five dice. Let's assume this was the result of Viridin's roll. When you're fighting a hero, the only results that could be potential hits are results of four or more. So we can remove this two and this one right away. So there are potentially three hits that Viridin can apply against Emma Goodluck. But now Emma gets to roll, and she's going to roll using her magic rating. So if we assume that this was the result of Emma's roll, Viridin is in a bit of trouble. The 2 is not high enough to count as a potential hit, so it'll be removed. And all of her results, 4 or more, now can count as potential hits. But Emma, because she was the attacker, has the option to assign any of her attack rolls of 4 or higher as blocks against Viridin's attack. 
So Emma might choose to use one of these dice to block one of the attacks from getting through, but the remainder she'll leave as attacking dice. This means that Bearden will do two damage to Emma Goodluck. However, Emma will do four damage to Bearden, and those four wounds added to the two wounds that Bearden already had means that his life total has been reduced to zero. Once a hero's life total has been reduced to zero, that hero is knocked out, and you place the hero's model on its side. You then reduce the damage on that knocked down hero to half of his life total, so we'll remove these three wounds here. And then that knocked down hero must leave one treasure or artifact behind. And remember, he collected this poison dagger, which is really useless to him, so he's not going to mind dropping this behind. Although it could prove useful to another player. Knocked down heroes can't be the target of future attacks while they're still knocked down. On Bearden's next turn, he'll be able to stand his model up, but he will not be able to take any actions during his turn. Then on his next turn, he will continue as normal. Now sometimes you might end up on a tile with a monster you do not want to fight, and that's when you can use the escape action. Now let's assume Bearden is on this tile with the war altar and wants to run like a scared little chicken. To do that, he would roll a number of dice equal to his skill level, which is currently 2. If any of his dice are equal to or higher than the escape rating on the war altar, which in this case is 3 or more, then Bearden successfully escapes and can move to a new tile. If, however, he'd been unlucky, he would not be able to escape, and the monster would get a free attack against Bearden. Free attacks are just like regular battles, except the hero does not get to roll any dice. So in this case, the war altar would roll six dice, and any results of three, four, or five would count as immediate hits against Bearden. Another action you can perform is the equip action. Let's say at some point during the game, Bearden had collected the heroic armor treasure and had that in his loot pile, and now wanted to equip it. Using the equip action, he can then take that treasure card from his loot pile and place it face up beside his hero card. As long as he has the slot available for the equipment and has the appropriate training, Bearden can now equip and use the abilities of this item. You can also use your equip action to trade with another hero that's on your tile. No hero has to agree to the trade, but if they are agreeable, you can swap items with that other hero. The last of the major actions that you can perform is the advance action. If over the course of the game you have collected at least two encounter cards, and remember encounter cards are usually monsters or trap cards, then you can trade in and discard those two encounter cards as your advance action. This will allow you to choose either a brawn, magic, or skill training bonus. In this case, if we chose the magic bonus, we would just take this token and place it by our hero card. Also, remember earlier in the video we discussed that each player gets a pile of ability cards. When you advance your hero, you get to draw two of the ability cards, read them, and then choose one to keep and the other to discard. These special abilities will then stay with you for the rest of the game, and you'll be able to use them when they apply. And each time you advance, you'll be able to add a new kind of training token and draw a new kind of ability card. So advancing your heroes is very important if you hope to win. So to summarize what we've learned so far, on your turn you may take up to two actions, and those actions can be either moving, escaping, battling, equipping, searching, or advancing. However, there are five other actions available to you, and they are considered free actions. So in addition to your two actions, you can do any number of these other five actions any time they apply. One of those free actions is the disarm action. Anytime you go to a tile and are forced to reveal an encounter card that is a trap, like say these falling boulders, you must immediately attempt to disarm the trap. The disarm requirements are listed on the card, and that disarming action does not use up one of your two actions that you can use during your turn. Another free action is the rally free action. Now this is a good one. Anytime you defeat a monster, or resolve a trap successfully, or when you assist another hero in a task, and we'll get to how you do that in a moment. Anytime that happens, you get to rally, and rallying means you get to remove one wound token from your hero. Another free action you can perform is the assist or sabotage action. 
The assist action and the sabotage action are actions you can take when it's not your turn, but you're on the same tile as another hero who is attempting to battle, disarm, or perform an escape. If you choose to assist that hero, you get to choose either your brawn or magic rating and add half that value to the dice that that other hero is trying to roll to either evade, battle, or disarm a trap. And remember, when you assist, you also get a free rally action. Even if the hero that you helped out was not successful in their attempt. In this case, it's the thought that counts. So your attempt to help them will earn you that rally action. Now sabotage, as you can imagine, is kind of the opposite of helping out the hero. Before a hero rolls a dice to escape, battle, or disarm a trap, other heroes can choose to use the free sabotage action. When you've been sabotaged, you have to roll two less dice than you normally would, but you always get to roll at least one die. The catch is that if you succeed despite being sabotaged by the other players, those other players who contributed to the sabotage each take one wound. Nothing better than a little payback. If there are multiple heroes on a tile, any number of those heroes can choose to either assist or sabotage, but they can't do both. The other free action is the summon action, but that only happens during what they call the end game, after someone has collected the summoner stone. So we'll talk about that later during the gameplay. Now that we've discussed all the different actions you can take during the game, let's just cover the last few gameplay rules that we need to go over. One of these rules is monster roaming. During a round, after play has come back to the first player, but before the first player passes the token, to the player on his left, the monsters roam. The first player must move every monster currently on a tile without a hero to an adjacent tile. Monsters cannot be moved to tiles that already contain monsters, so the wolf could not go to the south. However, it would have to go in this direction over here because there's no tile here or here. Boss monsters will also roam, but they have the ability to teleport, so the first player can move the boss monster to any tile that does not already have a monster on it. Unless the monster that's moving is a beast monster, any treasure cards that had been on the tile with that monster will move with the monster to the new tile. Let's assume for the moment that this is the last tile in the dungeon tile stack. Of course that would never be or this would be an incredibly small dungeon, but let's just assume that. So when the player decides to move over here to this room, they reveal the last tile and then immediately Place the boss lair tile adjacent to the tile that is farthest from the entrance, which in this case would be this tile here. So this boss lair would be attached like so. The boss card that was randomly chosen during the setup of the game is then revealed and placed in the boss lair. Now it's time for the heroes to get down to business. The boss needs to be defeated. Once the boss monster is defeated, it is removed and the summoning stone is put in its place. As soon as a hero picks up the summoning stone by searching that tile, the end game has begun. There are special rules that take place during the end game. For one, if your life total is reduced to zero, you are not just knocked down, you are killed and removed permanently from the game, dropping all of your items in the room where you were killed. Also, before the end game, you can freely move through tiles that have heroes without attacking them. However, during the end game, if you want to leave a tile where another hero is located, you have to do an evade action. And remember, if you fail, they get a free attack against you. Also, don't forget, once you collect the summoning stone, you are then able to use the special summoning ability that is located on your hero card. You also get to collect and keep the first player token during the entire time that you possess the summoning stone. You also get the free action known as the summon action that we mentioned earlier, and we will show how that works once we actually get to that point during our game play. To win, all you need to do is to get your hero, now in the possession of the summoning stone, back to the entrance tile. The only problem? All the rest of the heroes in the game will be trying to stop you. And there you have it. That's all the rules you need for now, and maybe that's more than what you wanted. 
The first video is always the hardest. It's a lot of information. Hopefully it hasn't overloaded you too much. If you've made it to this point, trust me, it all gets easier from here. Because the rest of the video is going to be us playing and all the things that we've talked about, even if you haven't absorbed all of it, it will come back to you and it will be reinforced during our gameplay. If you have any questions at all, now is a great time to ask because between this video and the next, if I think there's something important I've missed, I can add it into the next video. Also, before we go, I want to say thanks to a couple of my favorite game stores. Now, I'm not collecting any revenue from them. They have supported me in the past, but I just want to mention them to you. One of them is Game On. It is a local game store here in Prince Edward Island where I live. They're a fantastic store. They have a great selection. Friendly owner who runs it and has always been a great supporter of our show. The last game store I want to mention is Myriad Games in Salem, New Hampshire. They have another location as well. I'm not quite sure where that one is. But this is a great store. I visited it once. They have a fantastic selection, excellent, friendly staff, and they support a number of board gaming media creator enthusiasts like myself. If you're ever in the area or nearby, go out of your way and go check out that store. If you love board games or just games in general, you will not regret it, I promise you. Well, that's it for now. In the next video, we'll show you how to set up for a game, and then the real fun begins. We'll see you then.